moment of our final uh, speaker, keynote speaker for tonight, which is Duncan Preacher. Duncan, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Can you Hi, hear Duncan, me? how are you? Yeah, here we are. There I am. Okay, how you doing? Well, good to see you. I'm a bit tired, as I was saying, but it's been a couple of challenging days, but I'm fine. Thank you. So I'm new to uh, Teams. I've just been sitting quietly listening during uh, John's talk. Um, what do I do to share screen now? Okay, I see. So, uh, so Duncan is uh, Counselor Professor of Philosophy and the Director of Graduate Studies at the University of California, Irvine. He was previously Professor of Philosophy and Chair in Epistemology at the University of Edinburgh. His research is mainly in the, the field of epistemology. Uh, his publications include Epistemic Angst, Radical Skepticism and the Groundlessness of Our Believing, Epistemological Disjunctivism, What is This Thing Called Knowledge, and Epistemic Luck. Please, it's great to have you here. Welcome, Duncan. Uh, thanks very much. Um, so, nothing seems to be happening. What, what, how do I share a screen? On, uh, sorry, I've never used Microsoft Teams before. How do I share a screen? I think you are because I see my face in the... <laughs> This is the PowerPoint, right? You can't see me. Okay. All right. That's good. All right. At least I know. Okay. Good. Um, sure. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. As I say, um, Microsoft Teams obviously must be, in some countries it must be common, but we don't really use it. Um, so thanks very much for inviting me. I'm very pleased to be here. I, I enjoyed, um, it's always an honor to follow uh, John Greco. I enjoyed his session just now. So what I'm going to talk about is um, quasi fideism. So this is a view I started. Um, uh, talking about um, about 10 years ago. Uh, it seems to me that it's more accurately represents what Wittgenstein's view was about the rationality of religious belief, at least as we when, once we get to his final works, uh, his final notebooks that got published as, um, as uncertainty. And also it seems to me a position that really ought to be inserted into the sort of topography of the debate, right? Uh, uh, it seems like it's a it's a viable position uh, within that, so uh, we, it should be there as an option on the table. Um, there's also let me just say a little bit about this sort of exegetical background to this. So in uncertainty, these are these notebooks. They take us up to a few days before Wittgenstein dies, unedited by him. They're just impressionistic remarks. So it's it's unclear what exactly we should infer from them. But the, one thing that's striking about them, not just me, I think a lot of people are, are struck by this is. How does this completely new idea appears there? An idea about the the structure of rational evaluation. This is the what's these days called hinge epistemology. I'm going to talk about that today. Where does this idea come from? And I think it's at least arguable <coughs> that it comes from John Henry Newman. Wittgenstein mentions Newman in the notebooks. Well, he mentions A. Newman, but we we know from independent sources that it's John Henry Newman he's talking about. We know that he'd read. Uh, Newman's work at the time Wittgenstein was writing most intellectuals had read Newman he was that kind of figure but Wittgenstein especially would have been interested in his work and um, uh, and in particular with his essay Native of Grammar of Ascent which is his most philosophical work and what's really interesting is that um, Newman I think at least once you're looking for it in that work seems to be setting out <coughs> excuse me what I'm going to call a quasi-fideistic position that is, he's arguing, he's offering a certain kind of defense of the rationality of religious belief in the light of um, objections, principally from Locke, but also Hume is responding to. And he offers this, uh, he, not his terminology, my terminology, quasi theistic. I think this is where Wittgenstein gets this general idea of the, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> this general hinge idea about the structure of rational evaluation. And I think what's going on in uncertainty is Wittgenstein's considering this, this idea in general. He's not pretty much focused on the religious case, but if you think that this idea came from the religious case, then it's at least plausible that Wittgenstein want to apply that this idea back to the religious case. And that's effectively what quasi-fideism is. So I think the views, it's, it's interesting. Um, I think it's defensible, at least, as I'll explain. That doesn't mean it's true, obviously. Uh, but I also think it's exegetically important. I think it gives us a way of thinking about what Wittgenstein's up to, because remember, Wittgenstein is usually read as a straight fideist, and for good reason, because most of his later works seem to incorporate a fideistic point of view. I mean, I'm thinking particularly of um, of the work that was published in, around that same time as Uncertainty, actually. Uh, it was published as Wittgenstein's Lectures and Conversations on Aesthetics, Psychology and Religious Belief. It came out in 66. 
so three years before uncertainty, where he seems to set out pretty clearly a fideistic kind of position. But if this is right, by the end of his life, he was, uh, his, his, his view had shifted somewhat. I think it's also, uh, I'm going to mention briefly, this might be seem orthogonal, but I don't think it is, um, the Peronian influence on Wittgenstein. There's been a lot of discussion of this. Um, Hans Luger, for example, has pointed out the influence of, um, and others, of Fritz Mauthner's work on, on Wittgenstein and how there's a Peronian trend, Peronian current that runs all the way through Wittgenstein's work. I mean, it's not a, an accident that he uses the famous uh, idea of uh, throwing the ladder away that we get from Sextus uh, in the Tractatus, but the Peronian spirit, I think, is also alive in uncertainty. And I'll, I'll explain how that might feed into um, quasi fideism as we go along. So the structure of the talk is I'm going to tell you a little bit about hinge epistemology, um, this, this radical view of the structure of rational evaluations of Vickers and I won't be defending it. There's no time for that. Um, I'm just going to describe it. Uh, then I'm going to talk about its application uh, to the religious case, quite if it is. And I'm going to say a little bit about how the view relates to rival views. So I think that's a good way of understanding what the position amounts to. And then quasi-fideism now has been around long enough that there's a, there's a whole bunch of objections to it. So I'm going to consider some objections. Um, I'm not going to say who said what, because that takes a lot of time. But I mean, if you're interested, there's work by Jerome de Ritter, Michael Williams, Neil Gascoigne, Roberto de Segli, Guy Bennett Hunter and others uh, critiquing, or in some cases, not, not so much critiquing, just sort of refining quasi-fideism. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about some of these objections. And as we'll see, um, I think there are some genuine issues about whether or not we really want to apply hinge epistemology to the religious case. There is a decision point here, and I want to draw out exactly what's what what the what, what's what's in question there. Okay, let me start with Wittgenstein's view about hinge commitments. He offers a very radical picture. It's a picture on which all rational evaluation, by its nature, so of necessity, but of a matter of logic, as he puts it takes place relative to common sense more uncertainties. Notice common sense certainties. So some people think about the hinge commitments as being theoretical claims. I think that's Wittgenstein is that's not his view. These are these are common sense claims. It's common sense certainty. And it's that common sense certainty, this overarching common sense certainty that has to be in place in order for rational evaluation to occur, and which therefore is itself immune to rational evaluation. So that which we're most certain of after all theoretical claims we're not usually optimally certain of these everyday certainties these quotidian certainties uh, the hinge commitments they are themselves essentially are irrational but they have to be in place in order for rational evaluation to occur if that's right then it has some striking consequences one of which is that all rational evaluation now is essentially a local matter the very idea of a fully general rational evaluation whether positive or negative is simply incoherent Notice I say positive or negative here. The skeptic wants to make a fully general rational evaluation and find us wanting. That's incoherent, but so is traditional anti-skepticism as well. The idea of rationally evaluating our beliefs all at once and finding them in good order is also incoherent on the Wittgensteinian view. Indeed, the key to releasing ourselves from, uh, from the specter of skepticism is precisely to get rid of this faulty picture on which rash, fully general rational evaluations are possible. Uh, that's how the fly gets out of the, uh, the fly bottle. Related to this, our hinge commitments are non-optional. We can make no sense of rational subject or lack of them. This is just emphasizing the point. It's not a contingent matter about us uh, that we, our practices are structured this way. Wittgenstein repeats again and again. It's in the nature of our practices that they're structured this way. You know, these are not mere assumptions that we can discharge or something like that. Uh, you know, it's not like if only we were cleverer, more consistent, or our practices had developed differently or something like that, we could have done without the hinge commitments. It's like, we have to understand this is what it is to be a rational subject. And that's why it follows that the rational support enjoyed by our non-hinge beliefs is, is bona fide, even despite everything I've said so far. Because you might think, well, given what I've said so far, why not just be a skeptic? You know, our most basic common sense certainties are irrational. Well, then isn't everything irrational? Now, Wittgenstein is saying, no, 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 that, that is itself to subscribe to the faulty picture, right? The picture on which, you know, any kind of rational support presupposes, you know, that one's rational support in general is in good order. That's, that's the faulty picture that must be rejected. It's not, it's not even part of our common sense picture itself. 
it's it's a faulty theoretical claim which is masquerading as common sense so the antidote to skepticism is re i mean it's kind of paradoxical at face value the antidote to skepticism is recognized now most basic certainty is very rational <laughs> but i think i think that's you know it's a radical view but i think this is the view that he's trying to convince us of let me say a little bit about how my particular reading of what's going on in, in Wittgenstein, which is in uh, in uncertainty, which, you know, there are many, many readings. So, um, you know, you should take it with a grain of salt, obviously, as with all philosophy. But I, I want to take seriously on my view the, the, the way Wittgenstein talks about these hinge commitments. You'll notice I talk about hinge commitments, not hinge propositions. I'm more interested in the nature of the commitment rather than what it's a commitment to. I think the reasons why it'll become apparent as we move through this. In particular, you know, Wittgenstein talks about the animal, visceral, primitive nature of this hinge commitment. They're not acquired, at least not directly. I'll explain the qualifier as we go along. Acquired via rational processes. You know, no one teaches you you have hands. That you have hands is something you swallow down, the worldview, you know, with all the other things that you're taught. You're taught to do things with your hands and so on. And they're not directly responsive to rational considerations either. Again, I'll explain the directly qualifier. We can act as if they are, and we do. Philosophers do all the time. We act as if we can hold our hinge commitments up to up to doubt, and we can question their rational basis and so forth. This is a on the Wittgenstein view. This is a fiction, and if we look closely at our actual behaviour and how the certainty is manifest in that behaviour, it's clear that this is a fiction. I've wanted to argue. I've tried to argue that. If you take this seriously, then we're not to think of our hinge commitments as beliefs, at least in the specific sense of belief that's of interest to epistemology. And by that, I mean that propositional attitude that's a constituent part of knowledge. I think I would say rationally grounded knowledge, but the very least knowledge. So belief in the folk sense is very broad. You know, I think just a whole range of propositional attitudes. Any I mean, basically any kind of endorsement of a proposition counts as a belief in the folk sense. But I think there's a more narrow sense of belief, which is relevant to knowledge, which is a genuine commitment to the truth of a proposition. And it has certain basic conceptual connections to reasons and truth thereby. And I don't think our hinge commitments are beliefs in that sense. They're not k apt beliefs, as I call them. So in particular, a k apt commitment to the truth of a proposition is the kind of commitment where it can't coexist with recognizing that you've got no rational basis for its truth. That's not That wouldn't be a k apt believing. But of course, hinge commitments, if you take Wittgenstein seriously, are precisely the kind of commitments, the kind of certainty that would coexist with a, coming to be aware that you have no rational basis for their truth. Right? The certainty would be unaffected by this. So if that's right, they're, they're not chaotic believings. Interesting question, what kind of propositional attitude they are. In the book, I say, um, the Epistemic Angst book, I go through lots of different propositional attitudes here and explain why out believings don't fall into that class. They're not acceptances, they're not trust things, they're not hypotheses or assumptions, they're not leaps in the, the Gendler sense. I think the, the attitude is uh, sui generis. Um, but, um, you know, we can still, nonetheless, we can say a lot about it by saying what it isn't, you know, and saying how it relates to these other attitudes. <coughs> I think that they're not chaotic beliefs explain why closure style inferences don't apply to our hinge commitments. So closure style inferences, these are inferences we use in skeptical arguments, and they're ways of basically taking our lack of knowledge in one area and un to undermine uh, what we think of as being knowledge in another area. Uh, so we can't know the denials of skeptical hypotheses, therefore we can't know everyday claims and so on. Uh, closure is important to the skeptical argument for that reason. Properly understood, as I've argued, has to be a kind of competent deduction principle where what's acquired is a chaotic believing. But of course, if that's right, then uh, they, they can't be, by definition, can't be applicable to uh, hinge commitments. Our hinge commitments are not chaotic believings, and they're certainly not acquired via rational processes like a, a competent deduction. So that's an important point. Um, it turns out if you take Wittgenstein seriously, he's not denying closure. He's uh, rather he's giving us a, an account of the distinctive nature of these attitudes such that closure style inferences simply don't apply. Uh, one more thing I want to say about my own view is um, the uber hinge commitment. And I think this is a very, I think this is Wittgenstein's view as well. So a lot of accounts of hinge epistemology, they emphasize the trogenous nature of our hinge commitments <coughs> because they look atrogenous, right? They look like they're very variable in terms of person, place, culture, epoch, and so on. You know, I've got two hands. I've never been to the moon. 
uh, I'm speaking English and so on. These look like very, very rel relativized kinds of claims in terms of, you know, someone on the other side of the world <coughs> would have different hinges and so forth. But I think a lot of this, um, this variability is actually quite superficial. You know, I, I, a hinge commitment for me that I'm speaking English is a hinge commitment for someone on the other side of the world that they're speaking Chinese. It's basically the same hinge commitment, right? I mean, it manifests itself in a slightly different content. But, you know, and same with I have two hands. Anyone in my condition, in my circumstances right now, I think would be intercommitted to having two hands. What's going on here, I think, is that, and I think that this is precisely what Wittgenstein argues, is that really what's in play is an overarching hinge commitment, an overarching certainty. And it's a certainty that we're not radically and fundamentally mistaken. And that one specific hinge commitment are manifestations of that certainty. So I'm not suggesting that people have a current thought with a with the Uber hinge commitment as a content. Rather, the idea is that it's manifest in 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 a subject's actions that they have this Uber hinge commitment. So we have a set of chaotic beliefs that people have. We have the Uber hinge commitment. Put the two together, this will the Uber hinge commitment will manifest itself in specific commitments to specific propositions in specific conditions. And this explains why our Uber uh, hinge commitments can change depending on conditions and indeed change over time. So, you know, it's it's a it's an hinge commitment of mine right now that I've got two hands. But if I wake up tomorrow and, uh, you know, I've been in a car accident and I'm covered in bandages and so on, it may um, uh, it may now not be a hinge commitment that I've got two hands. In fact, probably won't. In fact, in that context, it might make perfect sense to base my belief that I've got hands on my seeing them. You know, do I have hands? I might wonder, oh, yes, there they are. In normal conditions, as Wittgenstein points out, the, you know, the, our relationship between seeing hands and having hands isn't like that. It's not, you know, Duncan, do you have two hands? Oh, hang on a minute. I'll just check. Oh, yes, there they are. That's not, you know, it, it works for your keys. It doesn't work for your hands, right? Oh, uh, similarly, you know, he, uh, Moore says that it's a hinge commitment that he's never been to the moon. Well, you know, given his set of beliefs and given our set of chaotic beliefs, I think that that's a plausible hinge commitment, a plausible manifestation of the Uber hinge commitment. But over time, you know, we can imagine a future world where our beliefs are different because circumstances are different and where it no, we, we no longer have that hinge commitment anymore. The chaotic beliefs change and the hinges change as a result. So this is the sense in which uh, hinge commitments can be indirectly responsive to rational considerations because they, they're essentially a function of our chaotic beliefs and our chaotic beliefs can change uh, in response to rational considerations. So that's basically hinge epistemology. I'm not going to say, I'm certainly not going to be defending it, but that's just telling you what it is, or well, what I think it is anyway. Okay, quasi-fideism then is the application of that idea to the religious case. And I think it's pretty straightforward how it works. The, the fideistic part of the story is yeah, a fundamental religious commitment, a hinge commitment, so a rational. That's the fideistic part. But there's also the quasi-fideistic part, which is really important, the quasi part. This is compatible with one's general religious beliefs having a rational standing, just as in the ordinary case. You know, ordinary beliefs have a rational standing, but one's basic commitments are irrational. So in the religious case, one's ordinary religious beliefs <coughs> have a rational standing, and one's basic religious commitments are irrational. And you'll see here there's a kind of parity argument in play, uh, one that's not available to fideism, <coughs> excuse me, which is that we can't criticize religious belief for having these basic irrational commitments, given that all belief has these irrational commitments on this view. Relatedly, we can also appeal to the to the, the closure point as well. So uh, you could motivate religious skepticism here if you had a closure type principle, because you could take your lack of knowledge as regards the, the, the core claims, the fundamental the hinge claims, and uh, and use that lack of knowledge to undermine your knowledge of the, the non-hinge claims using closure inferences. But of course, if the closure inferences don't apply, right, just as they don't apply in the skeptical case, then you couldn't do that. Okay, so what are the advantages of the view? I think there are uh, a number of them. I think we get to, um, we tread a course between the, uh, what I call the epistemic heroism of a, of a Lockean evidentialism, uh, and the epistemic ghettoization of a traditional form of fideism. In the first case, heroism, I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, uh, Locke and uh, his remarks about the enthusiasts in, uh, in his essay concerning human understanding. 
where he ends up advancing a sort of classical foundationalist uh, evidentialist view such that you know you've got to trace your religious beliefs back to these certainties and beliefs at the very least have to be probable given those certainties and so on the certainties have to be self-evident etc so the standards the epistemic standards are very high uh, obviously none of that is being demanded here i mean they're so high that it tends to license skepticism well uh, if your basic religious commitments are irrational and that that's fine you know that's meant held to be fine epistemically well then uh, we avoid that but it also crucially, I think, avoids the epistemic ghettoization of traditional theodism. Because remember, on the traditional theodistic view, beliefs in general are not to be so. Gen beliefs in general are evaluated epistemically, and then there's a, a, a special class of belief, religious belief, that's evaluated differently. But there's nothing like this going on here. I mean, this is the point about the parity argument. Religious beliefs are to be evaluated exactly the same as other beliefs. They're no different from from ordinary belief in having these irrational commitments at their core. And I think it's also, quasi-fetism is also faithful to distinctive features of at least a certain kind of basic religious conviction. It's phenomenology, it's fulcrum role in practices, it's unusual relationship to reasons. As I say, quasi-fetism presented as such is a, is a recent view, but I think, I think the view is represented, I mean, certainly it's represented nicely, I think, in literature. The picture there, in case you don't recognize it, Shizaku Endo, who I think uh, his works capture this. Other people like spring to mind, Graham Greene, Anthony Burgess, perhaps even Dostoevsky. Well, I've already talked about that. Um, it avoids evidentialism. You know, I think it's pretty clear how it, it, it's distinct from evidentialism, how it's clear, distinct from fideism. Let me say a little bit more about reformed epistemology, um, because here there are some, perhaps the closest parallels um, I suppose for this audience, you all know what reformed epistemology is. We, the thought, you know, parity argument in play, uh, our ordinary beliefs, our perceptual beliefs, that the, the basic kind of belief in play there is doesn't employ, it doesn't enjoy the kind of evidential support that a Lockean would, uh, evidentialist would demand. Nonetheless, you know, we can have knowledge in that domain because it satisfies, satisfies certain externalist criteria. Uh, it's, um, it's a reliable faculty functioning appropriately in generating true beliefs. Well, if that's appropriate here, why can't it, by parity of reasoning, be appropriate in the religious case? You know, we, we imagine a religious faculty appropriately functioning and reliably in conditions in which it's suited and so forth. And then that our basic religious beliefs don't have, don't meet the lock in evidentialist standard, doesn't really matter. What matters is whether it meets the, the externalist standard. And we can't criticize this because it's just that's the same kind of story that's told in the perceptual case. As I say, quasi fideism also has a parity argument, but it's kind of it's like an inverted form. Reformed epistemology wants to say, well, you know, basic religious belief is knowledge. And the model is ordinary basic belief uh, is knowledge because for externalist reasons in both cases. Here, the line is that uh, you know, basic religious conviction isn't knowledge, it's irrational, but that's okay because basic ordinary belief is also uh, essentially irrational. Okay, let me get on to some of the objections then to the view. Um, some issues I think are, are fairly minor and we don't need to worry too much about them. It's, although some critics I think do worry about them, um, wrongly I would claim. So one is about scope. Uh, a lot of objections basically proceed by saying, well, look, you know, these, these people over here, their religious conviction is nothing like this. And, well, you know, that's possible, of course. I mean, it's an empirical claim what religious conviction is like. It ha would have to be structured in a certain kind of way for quasi-fideism to apply. If it, if it wasn't structured that way, then obviously quasi-fideism wouldn't apply. I mean, I would suggest that it seems plausible. I think there's a reason why in literature... Um, uh, religious conviction is presented this way. I think it's plausible that this is they're capturing some this a, a deep insight there. But of course, it may not do, and that and if so, that just means it's inapplicable. Um, I I know someone, for example, who maintains that they they now believe they now have religious belief purely on the basis of uh, considering thinking about the fine tuning argument. I mean, that strikes me as an odd way to come to religious belief. But of course, if that is how, if that is possible, and that, that's the way they, in fact, form their belief, well, clearly quasi-fideism is not going to be an account of what's going on there. 
The other point which I think often gets misunderstood is this issue about non-belief. So I, I say, you know, our hinge commitments aren't beliefs, but I, I mean that in a very specific sense. They're not chaotic beliefs. They are beliefs in the folk sense. But some objectors, I mean, Derrida has one uh, has pushed this point and said, well, you know, on Pritchard's view, the quasi-fatalistic view, aren't we, don't we have to commit religious believers to high levels of sort of self-deceit or error at the very least? After all, because they, they think they believe these things, but on this view, they don't really believe them. But that doesn't follow at all. Uh, in the folk sense, they do believe them. Indeed, they're certain of them. So uh, it's just in this technical sense, they don't believe them. So there's no, there's no self-error there, or self-deceit. There might be another kind of self-deceit, though. Uh, and I think now we're getting to something a bit more, I don't think it works, but I think a bit more plausible, which is you might say, and some critics say, well, look, you know, even if we're capturing the religious conviction right, uh, isn't it true that most people think that they have good rational grounds for their beliefs? I mean, this whole practice, as I mentioned, natural, natural theology here, of providing a rational basis for belief. So wouldn't this commit the quasi-fides to thinking that there's a great deal, quite a lot of self-deceit going on? Two things to say here. One is about just to remind ourselves of the scope point. Of course, there may be people where their beliefs are actually based, they are in fact, religious beliefs are based on rational grounds. That, in that case, quasi-fetism wouldn't be applied. But I think there's another point, a deeper point to make here, I think it's perhaps the more plausible line to take, which is that if you look more closely at what's going on in the religious case, it's really not clear that the beliefs are based on the reasons, even if the reasons are playing some important role here. I mean, just think about what Wittgenstein says, you know, the belief that you've got hands and so on. Of course, you, you know, it's not that we, we, it's explicit in our practices that it's groundless. Uh, it's not explicit in our pra ordinary practices that it's, it's not um, grounded either. Uh, it just lies apart from the root travel by inquiry. But once we start to become aware of it, we could, and indeed philosophers do, think of ourselves as having grounded in what we see or something like that. Um, but Wittgenstein says, look, if you look even more closely still, you realize that's not what's going on. Uh, and I think this would be applicable also in the religious case. You know, I mean, take natural theology. Are, are, are the proponents of such a view, do they, is their religious convictions, are they provisional? Right? And are they, would they change if the evidence wasn't forthcoming? I mean, if they did, it seems that that would be odd to think that they ever had the, the conviction in the first place. Of course, if they did, well, then the scope issue kicks in, right? So either way, it doesn't seem to be an objection to quasi-fideism. The other problem is abominable conjunctions. If you've ever wondered what an abominable conjunction looks like, it's a picture of one I, 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 uh, I took there in the wild uh, recently. So you might think quasi-fideism is committed to such conjunctions. So this is a, a problem DeRose originally uh, makes for non-closure views, but it, it seems to apply here because you might think, well, look, isn't the quasi-fideus committed to conjunctions of the form, I know that, insert some specific religious claim that implies the religious hinge, but not that, and they insert the religious hinge. You know, I know that God loves me, but uh, I, I don't know that God lives, God exists, or something like that. And that would be puzzling. You know, a, a bald-faced assertion of a, of a conjunction of that kind is always puzzling. But it's hard to understand why a card-carrying quasi-fideus would ever assert such a conjunction, i.e. You know, boldly, without context or qualification. What they probably would do, do is, is, is assert that the conjunction, but with an explanation of why they're asserting it, an explanation which accounts for the, the, the hinge epistemology that underlies that claim. If they did that, there wouldn't be anything abominable about the, the assertion. Right? The other thing we need to remember here as well is that when someone says uh, um, that they don't know something, uh, when they assert that, you know, that qualification, I think there's, a, there's a, at least a weak implication they're not certain of it. And of course, in this case, that implication would be false because the, the hinge commitments, you're certain of them, even if you don't treat them as knowledge. So we need a way of cancelling that at the very least. Okay, now we get to some bigger issues. Um, epistemic relativism. So, Epistemic relativism is an issue for hinge epistemology in general. And it arises because uh, if you think the system of rational evaluation is hinge relative, and that's just what hinge epistemology does say, and if you think it's possible for, uh, for us to have distinct sets of hinge commitments, and surely it is possible, 
then that seems to, or so the thought goes, entail epistemic relativism. And you might think, well, look, if that's a problem for a hinge epistemology, it will be especially a problem for any hinge epistemology that uh, incorporates quasi-fideism, that extends to the religious case. Because obviously we don't all share our religious hinge commitments. I mean, that's just a straightforward fact about human beings. So you're going to have more divergence in uh, the hinge commitments. So here's how I think hinge epistemology should respond to the general problem here. I think we need to distinguish between two kinds of epistemic relativism, a weak and a strong. The weak version is just the idea there are distinct epistemic systems. The strong view is the idea there are distinct, not just distinct, but also incommensurate epistemic systems, i.e. the first, first is compatible. So having um, a distinct set of hinge commitments will entail the first. Whether or not it entails the second depends on, on just how broad the, the, um, the difference in hinge commitments are. So imagine two people who had more or less overlapping hinge commitments, but they had, you know, some divergence. That would give you weak epistemic relativism. It wouldn't give you in incommensurability. It seems incommensurability arises when you have quite radical divergences in your, your hinge commitments. Uh, incommensurability is when, you know, there's no in principle way of rationally resolving uh, disputes. But so long as you do have overlapping hinge commitments, particularly large bodies of overlapping hinge commitments, then it seems you would be a ways of, 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 of rationally resolving disputes. I mean, obviously it'd be hard to, hard to resolve them, but uh, the practical difficulty is not the worry. The worry is the in principle difficulty. And the thought is, well, given, given what we've been told here, there's no reason, we haven't yet been given a reason to expect that hinge epistemology, even one that includes quasi-fideism, must entail strong epistemic relativism just rather than the weak, right? But I think there is a deeper point going on here, um, which we should be recognizing. I think now we're starting to get to some of the um, some of the points where I think there are genuine concerns about uh, quasi-fideism. So at least on the hinge epistemology that I developed, the one that has the uber hinge at its heart, um, there's a huge amount of overlap in our hinge commitments. You know, the, the, the differences in our hinge commitments are mostly superficial. Uh, and to, to a great extent, uh, our hinge commitments are shared. If, you know, we shouldn't focus so much on the, the contents in play, but on the kind of commitment in play and how it manifests itself in those conditions. You know, anyone in my conditions, I think, would have the, almost anyone, would have the commitment to, the hinge commitment to having two hands, et cetera, et cetera. So that lessens the worry about epistemic relativism a great deal. And I think, I think it fits very much with, with the Wittgensteinian picture. So the hinge metaphor that he uses is perhaps suboptimal here. I mean, he means, you know, something holds fast for something else to happen. You know, the hinges hold, the certainties hold fast so that rational evaluation occurs. But the, the, the metaphor kind of implies optionality. You know, we can move our hinges at will. That's not really what Wittgenstein has in mind at all. And I think a better metaphor actually is the, the riverbed that he uses around section 95. You know, the, what's part of the river and what's part of the riverbed. So the riverbed is our non-hinge commitments. Sorry, the riverbed is our hinge commitments and the river is our non-hinge commitments. But over time, you know, what's part of one can become part of the other and vice versa. And this has, a, you know, that metaphor has a more of a social, shared social experience of, of, of which key to the Wittgensteinian picture of the acquisition of hinges. And this, you know, the idea of hinge commitments is changing gradually over time and so forth. And I think that's a better way of thinking about how, so even though there can be divergences in our hinge commitments, how they can be of their nature quite marginal. However, once we get to the religious hinge commitments, it does seem more plausible that the divergences now become much greater. Obviously, they're not wide, more widely shared, but also worse than that, they don't seem to be the kinds of commitments which anyone in those circumstances would have. I mean, this is a little harder to make stick, but you know, it seems like anyone in my circumstances or pretty much anyone in my circumstances right now would be inch committed to having two hands, but not anyone, you know, to take two people in the same circumstances, one might have the religious conviction and one might not. Doesn't seem any reason why that necessitates one having the one commitment or the other. And I think this is you know, generally true when we start thinking of hinge commitments as being religious or ethical or political, or aesthetic or what have you, is the broadly value commitments. Here's another disanalogy, which I think is interesting. So 
I think what we should do now is distinguish between what we might say are our quotidian hinges, they're the ones that we tend to share, and the non-quotidian ones where there's quite a lot of divergence, the more axiological ones like religious hinge commitments. As Wittgenstein says, one doesn't even normally consider the quotidian hinges, right? It's not, they're hidden, as it were, in plain view. It's a very interesting feature of them. You know, that, that I'm hinge committed to having two hands, it's not like anything hides it. But it, they, as he says, they lies apart from the route traveled by inquiry. We just don't, it's not, not, don't consider it. So when we do start to consider them, it's kind of striking. I mean, I think Stanley Cavell's work is really interesting on this point. I mean, he appeals to this Freudian idea of the, the uncanniness of the everyday. When we become aware of these common sense convictions and the role they play, they, they feel uncanny. You know, even though they've been right in front of us the whole time. I think this relates to a phenomenon that I call epistemic vertigo. Uh, it, it generates a certain kind of um, a queasiness, as it were, when we, we realize the role that they play. Religious hinges, though, the non-quotidian kind, they're these non-quotidian hinges, they're, they're not like that. I mean, it's part of, it's, it's standardly part of the practice to, to bring them to the fore, to make them explicit. I mean, there are creeds, you know, one must recite and so forth. So this is a very different, this is a very different feature, I think, of what's going on with the, these non-quotidian hinges. And more generally, if we think, you know, the hinges, religious hinges as hinges, then I think this applies to, you know, would apply if we start thinking of ethical hinges or political hinges or aesthetic hinges and so on. And then a final issue I want to raise, and this, as far as I'm aware, no one, no one else has raised this, but this is something that worried me. Uh, I call it, it's a worry about honest doubt. I, you might be familiar with the phrase, I, I'm getting this from the, um, the famous Tennyson poem in memoriam. If you remember in that poem, Tennyson writes, um, he says that, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you the line because I think it's a great line, it's a very Wittgenstein line actually. He says, there lives more faith in honest doubt, believe me, than in half the creeds. And I mean, that idea lives more faith in honest doubt. And, and what Tennyson's responding to here is he's, 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 he's responding to the charge, as he puts it, that doubt is devil born. Uh, I mean, Tennyson's giving expression to a certain kind of sceptical fideism, right? So this idea that uh, of scepticism as, as, as being a sort of a, a path to religious conviction or being a part of the acquisition or manifestation of religious conviction. And that's always struck me as a very interesting idea. But you might think on the face of it that quasi fideism stands in opposition to it by treating these, uh, these basic claims as religious hinges. Um, and I think actually this is a, the, the, this problem isn't a real problem. And in fact, it's quite enlightening to realize why. So take, take Montaigne. So one of my philosophical issues, heroes rather, who's pictured here, very much a representative of this skeptical fideistic tradition. Indeed, I mean, it's the, the skeptical fideism is precisely why uh, Popkin in his magisterial uh, work on the history of skepticism describes um, Montaigne's The Apology for Raymond de Bond as the, the womb of modern thought, precisely because of this manifestation of the Peronian doubt as, as, as in a sense showing that which is beyond doubt. Uh, I mean, Montaigne applies these Peronian skeptical techniques and in doing so, he comes to discover his religious conviction is the kind of thing that is immune to them. Uh, uh, it doesn't stand in need of reasons. It is there, it's like breathing. It's not the kind of thing that's, uh, so it's, it is like the hinge commitment. So he uncovers the hinge commitment through the doubt. And I think that's interesting. That's a way of thinking that skeptical fideism and quasi fideism could go together. And given what I mentioned earlier about the Peronian influence on Wittgenstein, I think that's perhaps not as surprising as it should be. You know, the manifestation of doubt, the systematic manifestation of doubt could be compatible with there being an irrational basis at the heart of religious conviction. It could be that's just a way of uncovering what's there, right? a way of revealing that the scope of, of what's uh, beyond doubt is broader than we might have thought on, on the standard Peronian grounds. OK, concluding remarks. So a little bit more honest doubt. Quasi fideism, obviously, it, it's at best only as plausible as the hinge epistemology that it underpins it. And we haven't argued for that. Many of the problems it faces uh, inherit from that general proposal. But I think worse than that, um, quasi-fideism, I think, extends hinge epistemology, adds uh, further dimensions to it, because there are some disanalogies between our ordinary common sense, as I call them, quotidian hinges, and the religious hinges. 
So if you go down the route of applying hinge epistemology to the religious case, I think you are committed to having a broader conception of what counts as a hinge. You're, you're committed to embracing some of these disanalogies. You know, like the hinge commitments can be the kinds of things that are, aren't hidden from view in plain, aren't hidden in plain view, but actually are explicitly uh, uh, in, in, in at the, the object of inquiry, specifically the object of assertion of, uh, of defense and so on. Um, and also that, um, you know, there can be greater divergence in our hinge commitments than we might have hitherto thought was possible on the standard hinge epistemology line. So, so there's an important decision point here, I think. Even if you go down the hinge epistemology line, if you want to apply it to the religious case and endorse quasi-fideism, you have to be willing to, 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 to extend the view. And I think uh, if, I mean, final point I'll make here, I think if you're, one is going to go down that route, you need to an explanation of how these non-quotidian hinges, how they relate to the quotidian ones, how do we explain their distinctive properties? And I think that probably means not just considering the religious case, but also considering other kinds of what I'm calling axiological hinges, ethical, political, uh, aesthetic, and so forth. Perhaps, yeah, eudaimonic or something. Okay, I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks a lot, Duncan. So, are there any questions? Okay, I'm back on the screen. Cool. <laughs> so, questions? Okay, John Greco, first question. Hi, Duncan, thanks for the talk. That was uh, really well done. Um, so, I guess my question about quasi fideism is very much connected to the sort of stability of a non epistemic reading of hinges. And I, I take it that the, the non epistemic reading and the quasi fideism kind of go hand in hand, right? So I guess my question is um, even if we are sympathetic with the idea that knowledge as such requires a certain kind of functional profile that the hinge commitments don't have. Uh, you still raise a question about a different kind of epistemic evaluation of hinge commitments, because you could still ask whether or not they appropriately serve as hinges. So in other words, I take it that that Wittgenstein or you wouldn't think that just any old commitment could serve as a hinge commitment. There must be ones that maybe if they're not knowledge apt belief, they're knowledge apt in a different way. They're apt for framing knowledge. Um, and so that's what I mean about sort of the instability of the epistemic reading, because it, it looks like even if you agree that they don't count as knowledge, they seem to be subject to some kind of epistemic evaluation in the sense of whether they can serve to appropriately frame knowledge. And um, so you would say that, you know, they either pass or, you know, they, they either pass or fail that test of being epistemically apt in a different sense, in which case you sort of lose the substance of the fideism, right? Because it'd be the question as well, does your, do your religious hinge commitments, are they epistemically apt in this sense of, you know, being appropriate to serve as hinges? Uh, so I guess that's the... Okay, yeah, thanks, John. I think you've mentioned this before, and I'd like to nail down what the issue is actually, because um, what well, intrigues me, right? So. Obviously, they have to be true, right? Mm -hmm. Your hinges, if your hinges aren't true, then then they're not going to be, they, they won't, as, as you put it, frame knowledge. Um, you know, if, 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 it, I mean, this is, but, but this isn't like skepticism or anything like that. I mean, this is just the human condition. One, one might be radically in error, in which case one is sort of epistemically doomed. And if one's hinges are false, then one is radically in error. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, if right now I don't have two hands, then all bets are off epistemically. So in that sense, they have to be true. But I don't know what, in what other sense they have to be, as you put it, apt to frame knowledge. I mean, let me say a little bit more about what the hinges are, in my view. So they're not. So some people think about hinges as kind of like theoretical claims that. So this is a sort of Crispin Wright and Lisa Cleaver view, where they they're sort of prerequisites of being rational or something. So they they're sort of general rational requirements we have of a kind like I've got to believe I'm broadly, you know, my my senses are reliable. Or I've got to believe there's a past or, or or things like that. But on my view, that's not what they are. I mean, maybe we should be committed to these things, but those wouldn't be hinge commitments. The hinge commitments are just mundane certainties. They're, they're just manifestations of the super hinge. Relatedly, they're not just, it's not just anything you're pathologically certain of ends up being a hinge. It has to have the right kind of functional relationship between the uber hinge and your chaotic beliefs. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure there's any, to think of them as having to play some role to frame knowledge other than being true, I, I, I don't know what that would be, what kind of assessment that would be. Yeah, no, that's interesting because I, I actually thought I wasn't actually thinking that, that they would need to be true. I was thinking that maybe, uh, you know, you, you could have a, a fault set of hinge commitments that nevertheless has the sort of function of uh, allowing um, epistemic evaluation in ordinary life. So it's interesting that you think they, they actually they have to be true to function as hinges. So maybe if I just gave an example that would that would allow you to make some kind of comment on why the example you know wouldn't be wouldn't be apt to make the point I'm making. So so I can imagine a kind of theist who thinks, um, look, uh, my theism functions as a hinge commitment, and I understand how your naturalism fun fun functions as a hinge commitment. If you're a certain kind of naturalist, you're as committed as you could be, but it's more of it's more like a hinge. It's not, you know, uh, maybe maybe you know, despite your despite your own perception, it really is it is a, a sort of irrational commitment that actually you know frames just the way you approach the world in terms of the evaluations that you do make. Okay, so two points. One is the, the, the theism and the naturalism can't both be true, but they seem both to be able to function as hinges if this, if this can even get off the ground. And then two, both the naturalist and the theist might look down on some third sort of uh, new wave um, feel good kind of person who also seems to have a kind of commitment to some sort of, I can't, can't even think of the right, the right name for it, but you, you know, the, Oh, you're in California now, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but, but that might, that might function as a hinge in a sense, but not a good hinge, right? So, you know, both the naturalist and the theist might look down, uh, on, on, on this sort of, uh, new wave person as having a kind of, irrational hinge even even as they begrudgingly accept the alternative hinge of the uh as rational of their um their yeah okay th yeah that's useful i mean so the, the naturalist it might be a hinge commitment i suspect often it isn't it's just an ordinary commitment but it, it could be a hinge commitment mm -hmm. um you saying how it was puzzling that they could both be hinges and yet only one of them could be true but I, no i was saying you no, I was thinking that that seems perfectly fine. You're the one that said they have to be true. Ah, but they don't have to be. So they have to be true to be to perform this knowledge function. It's not to allow knowledge, right? So, like, if you know, if if the religious hinge is false, it's still a hinge. It doesn't stop being a hinge. It's just that you you, you don't have any religious knowledge then, right? I see. So I see. That, that's mean, the yeah. idea. So yeah, yeah. so the, you know, the naturalist would would be the one with the knowledge, and the religious person would be the one with that if, mm -hmm. if the one's false. But they're both. They would still both be hinges. Now, looking down on the third person, I mean, I think that's kind of, that's inevitable uh, and, and it's probably harmless. One thing I would say about the third person, though, is that, you know, hinges aren't the kinds of things that you, you won't kind of acquire them like a lifestyle choice. And I think, you know, so the, the thinking about the, you know, the California example might be inclined to tempt us in that direction to think, you know, like, 
uh, you know, a, a huge commitment to things, you know, you can like you can pick off the shelf, as it were, and just wear for the day or something. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think the Wittgensteinian story is very much a kind of, uh, it's quite Aristotelian in some respects. It has to be, the, the hinges have to become second nature to you. What you're adopting is a world picture. It takes time for that, to incorporate that, and it, be, and it becomes manifest in the certainty in your action. And so, you know, we, one reason why you might look down on these people is that we think it's kind of a, it's kind of like an affectation or something. It isn't the real thing. Um, I mean, pick pick someone where it is a product of their culture, but it's a product, but it's a culture that's looked down upon. And then you might say, well, look, you know, really, what what's there to criticize? Uh, it's a hinge for them, of course. It's you think it's false, right? Um, they think it's true. Uh, but but what they're manifesting in their their certainty in their actions and so forth is 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 their their, their different hinge commitments to you. I don't know if that helps. Yeah. No. Yeah. Help. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, any other question? Questions? Okay, if no one has a question, I have questions. So thanks, Duncan. Uh, I, I was wondering. Hmm? I, I knew I could count on you for questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Something that interests me a lot. No, I have actually two questions. Now, the first question is uh, I was wondering, well, according to your view, which one is, say, for instance, in the creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty. Uh, etc 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 which part is the hinges hinge commitment and which part is say like a epistemic part and how they connect each other like for instance the fact that god exists is a hinge proposition which is not a proposition because it cannot be either true or false and uh, I, this is the first yeah and the second one if i uh, i was thinking what do you think of the distinction? We have, we're talking a lot about this, like, uh, I don't know whether you've read the Swinburne uh, books on the distinction between faith and uh, the epistemic aspects of uh, religious belief and, uh, say, like the faith. Faith is more like a commitment and is more like, a uh, let's say, a commitment to a certain uh, more practical belief, let's say. So I was wondering uh, whether this distinction between uh, faith and belief can play a role in your account of injured epistemologies applied to religious belief. Thank yeah. you. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, the, the, the well, let me tell the second question because I, I, that's probably the easy one. I mean, I, I think it's actually very useful. So I think it's, it's it, epistemologists, even though they clearly have a specific notion of belief in mind, when it suits them, they, they use the folk notion, which is very broad, and it's it's not very helpful. The broad the broad notion is just you know so many propositional attitudes cover it, and I think he's telling me you know, in terms of the folk notion, religious faith, religious belief, they, they use the, use the words interchangeably, and yet clearly, religious conviction is very different from ordinary ordinary beliefs, right? So I think it's an advantage of this view that we're we're diff making sort of more fine grained distinctions in the propositional attitudes in play. And yeah, to think about a religious, so on this view, religious conviction would have a certain profile as a propositional attitude that would set it apart from chaotic believing. Still be a belief in the folk sense, but it's it has a distinctive profile. And of course, it's an open question. Is that, does that capture it correctly? I think it's certainly more plausible than thinking of it either as a chaotic belief or as, or just simply characterizing it as a folk belief, which is kind of useless, you know. And then the first, the first question is a great one. Uh, I deliberately am very careful not to say <laughs> which one is the, I mean, we could talk about God existing or something like that as being the basic commitment, but it's actually not obvious to me. And um, and I, I, I and I think it's, you'd have to look very closely at the practice to work out where the, where the distinction lies. It's easier, I think, in the quotidian case. You know, I have two hands and so on. I've never been to the moon. My name is, you know, we, I mean, as Wittgenstein says, we, we, it, it's not, it, it, it takes, it takes a certain kind of acumen to pick out even the quotidian hinges. I mean, it's like a philosophical discovery when you realize that they they play this unusual role. It's very, how could it be that they're right in front of you the whole time you didn't realize it? I think it's even harder in, in the religious case because you've got to unpick, you've got to, as it were, be immersed in a practice and unpick it from within. Newman, interestingly, 
I mean, some of the things he talks about, I mean, here's one case he gives, which is very telling here, I think. Uh, he, talk, he, he has a lovely discussion of humor miracles. And uh, he gets humor right. Um, you know, humor isn't saying, you know, miracles are impossible or it's never rational to believe in miracles or you always need independent basis for testimonial beliefs or anything like that. Hume's point is very specific, as Newman says, uh, you know, given what we know about human beings, uh, if your only basis for believing in something so incredible as a miracle is, is, is testimonial, then that's a problem. And, and the way he responds to this, Newman, is very striking. <laughs> he, says, uh, he, he says, Hume is exactly right about this. It, when you read it, it kind of throws you, because, of course, this is, this is he wasn't Cardinal Newman at that time. He was about to be Cardinal Newman. He's never a saint, right? But he's agreeing with Hume. But the point he's making is that the religious conviction in miracles, although it might be caused by testimony, isn't grounded in the testimony. And this reveals, so he's, he's thinking of like basic religion, so a world where miracles can occur. That, that's, part of the, that's part of an inch commitment. So presumably there's going to be, it's not going to be in isolation. It's got to be that embedded with some idea. I mean, I think it can't just be God exists. It's got to be like a God that one has some personal connection to. A God that can perform miracles or something. So it's kind of like there's a there's a there's a there's a web, there's a worldview, and it's not just one single claim. It's like a bunch of claims intersected which capture the hinge, and there's going to be other claims which are more sort of downstream of that. But it's very hard, I think, to you know a priori to delineate which bits are part of a hinge bit and which bit aren't, bits aren't. So yeah, we might say God exists, but I think that's too too thin. It's got to be like you need miracles, you need personal relationship, you need all kinds of things to capture what's going on there. So a theistic framework, like uh, the hinge uh, commitments should be a sort of, uh, we should say, a theistic framework. So like a supernatural versus uh, naturalistic worldview we were talking about yesterday with uh, Graham Oppi, it's kind of. Like we have two worldviews, let's say there are more, yeah. but we have the naturalistic worldview versus the supernaturalistic worldview. And in uh, the hinge commitment is to the this kind of worldview, which can include the existence of the uh, say of the supernatural, like God or, or soul, or so it's sort of a condition of possibility of religious belief. Thank you. Yeah, that sounds right. Thanks a lot. And this is why it can be true or false because it's a framework. So and the framework can't be you. Uh, true or false, according to Wittgenstein, or it's more it can be useful or nice. Or... Yeah, you see, I, I, I don't think that's Wittgenstein. So Wittgenstein does say things like that, but that's because, I mean, I think at times he's playing around with, he, like his theory of truth hasn't stabilized yet. Michael Williams talks nicely about this. And and he, he's sort of jumping back and forth between like a correspondence view, which is too demanding, and uh, and on the other hand, like an epistemic view of truth. And that's why at times he says things like, well, it's neither true nor false. But I, I don't think that's his considered view, I think, or at least it ought not to be. I mean, it's just either it's true or it's false. What, what's at issue is just um, it, it doesn't play a certain kind of epistemic role. It's not in the, it's not, it, uh, you know, one's inch commitments aren't, aren't rationally grounded. Um, it's a completely separate question whether or not they're true. I mean, so he, what he's doing there, he says it's neither true or false. It's like he's confusing the issue of whether it's true with the issue of what would be a rational basis for determining its truth? And uh, unless you have an epistemic conception of truth, I don't, don't see. Michael Williams says, you know, if only Wittgenstein had been aware of, or more aware, I guess he could have been aware, more aware of the deflationary account of truth, then he wouldn't have got himself into these problems. And that, that strikes me as having some plausibility, actually. Michael Williams, yeah. I see the conventionalist uh, account of. Thanks a lot, Duncan. Um, any other question? If not, uh, like it's me and Duncan talking about Wittgenstein, which is cool, but you know, it it's happened like, the old days. Days. <laughs> like in Edinburgh. Yeah. Okay. So thanks a lot. Thanks again for your question, for your talk. You know, it is usual. So, ah, thanks for having thanks me. For the talk. Okay. So, uh, thanks again. Thanks, Duncan. Thanks, John. Thanks for. So, can we have the, the link for tomorrow talk? Uh, Vinicius, seria possibile enviare un link? Sì, acabei de publicar no chat. Ah, já publicou? Ok, thanks a lot to our speakers and to you guys. So, I'll see you all tomorrow at 10, Brasilia time. We have uh, like uh, today and yesterday, we will have like four sessions. One session in the morning, two sessions in the afternoon, and the final section in uh, the evening, and then that's it.
So, any other question, feel free to invite me to send me an email or email uh, Vinicius. So, that's it. Thanks again. Good night. I'll see you tomorrow.